Welcome. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining us. This is, I, I just need to start on a personal note. As a journalist, it's just a huge thrill to be involved in anything to do with the New York Times. And I know that sounds toadying, but uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I was for many years with the Times, and now I'm an editor with Tortoise. And um, great pleasure to be here with Professor Tim Lenton. Tim, hi. You are the director of the Global Systems Institute at Exeter University. You've got many other titles to your name. Uh, but I think the most important uh, aspect of, what, of your work today is that you're in on the ground floor of tipping points in climate science, author of a seminal paper in 2008, which seems to have been built on and built on and built on. And if any of you were here for the first session this morning, we heard in very precise and alarming terms how these tipping points are beginning to work. I hope that in the course of the next half an hour, uh, we're going to hear from Tim, we're going to hear from, uh, get some questions from online as well as in the room as well, uh, and, and we're going to hear some potential upsides in the science of tipping points and climate science. But we have to ground this in reality, mm -hmm. don't we, Tim? Yeah, we've probably got to start with the bad news. Yeah. So, so give us your overview of... Uh, whether, whether tipping points are already in charge or not, and, and which alarm you most? Not quite in charge yet, thankfully, but there's uh, some pretty compelling evidence that we might have passed a tipping point in West Antarctica, where, which would eventually commit us to lose a large part of that ice sheet, uh, and we're then talking in the few metres of sea level rise. So that's certainly an alarming thought when you're awake at night. But it's, uh, it's also the interactions between tipping points that uh, trouble someone like me, because we see that beginning to unfold in actual evidence as well. We see the accelerated melt of the Arctic is melting the Greenland ice sheet ever faster. The meltwater pouring off Greenland is freshening the North Atlantic. That's contributing to slowing down the great circulation of the Atlantic, the great overturning circulation. We know from Earth's past that that moves the band of rain all around the tropics southwards. It disrupts the monsoons in West Africa, around the planet in India. It leaves heat behind in the Southern Ocean where it can do its worst, kind of further destabilizing the ice sheets there. So it's those cascading interactions between tipping points that are probably the biggest cause of alarm when I'm awake at night. But Tim, since you were a pioneer in, in this part of climate science, let me ask, what was your tipping point in, in the first decade of this century? Was there a particular, you, you've just itemized mm. um, a number of them. Um, was there, did you have a light bulb moment? Interesting question, Giles. It's, I think it's because of my scientific upbringing. I became a scientist because of Jim Lovelock's books on the Gaia hypothesis with this in incredible vision of the Earth as a living system. And I determined when I was like an 18-year-old kid studying in Cambridge that that's what I wanted to research. And that was the early, mid-90s. And so I grew up as an Earth system thinker, um, knowing that life had transformed the planet a, couple of, a few times in the past and made a habitable world for us, and that this was not a smooth transition. There were these great revolutions that transformed the planet. So tipping points is just an innate part of thinking in this Gaian way about the Earth as a self-regulating system. And so it's very natural as the 2000s kind of showed us the evidence of accelerating change on the Greenland ice sheet in the Arctic. And I, it was natural to me to want to synthesize and bring that knowledge together and raise the sort of red flag of risk it, it's taken a little while for the message to come, sink in and get through, I guess, in the broadest sense. But I've always thought we needed to be more, we needed as scientists to be treating climate change as the biggest risk management problem we've ever had. Uh, and that was the way I, that was part of what inspired me, yeah, to, to put pen to paper back in the early 2000s. But did, was there a particular expedition? Have you sat on the green? I had not, because I'm a theoretician by training. I did get, I can confess, I got to go to Greenland after I'd done the initial work and filmed there a series on, on a one episode of a series on tipping points. So I had that visceral personal experience of being with the Inuit hunters on the dog sleds going across the sea ice, which should have taken two, two days to get to the ice edge. We were there in six hours and we we're having some exciting moments with the dogs, with the sled trying to jump the opening cracks in the sea ice. So I've, 
I had that later. I had the, the real lived reality of rapid change in the Arctic. Blimey. Uh, we were hearing uh, in the earlier session that I referred to that since Paris, the trend in science has been to confirm everything that was in the IPCC reports at that point. And I think I'm quoting you in saying, forgive me if, if, if not, that the threshold at which tipping points, the temperature, the amount of warming at which tipping points are reckoned to uh, become active has fallen from four degrees to, to about one, and we've passed that. Is that over alarming? That's, that's not a bad summary. It's basically a summary of the last 20 years of, of assessments. 20 years ago, we thought we'd need to warm the planet up four or five degrees to really have a significant risk of big climate tipping points. Now we're seeing that at 1.1 degrees of warming, we're seeing some direct evidence that we may be past at least one tipping point in Antarctica. And we clearly see that one and a half degrees C is a lot better than two degrees C, that's for sure. But at one and a half, you'd have to say there are still some systems like major ice sheets that may be committed to a long-term irreversible collapse. And the only good news there is really that if we limit the amount of warming above the tipping point, we really slow down this eventual accumulation of sea level rise and right. melting of the ice. So there's still everything to play for in a sense slowing down, even if it's slowing the inevitable in that case. And then there's a huge amount to play for, obviously, in limiting warming. Because if you, now I would say, if we go to, if we were following current climate policy, what would it lead us to? About 2.7 degrees C of global warming? I think that's, that's game over for me. I, we don't want to go there. Right. That's, a, that's, a whole, that's a whole suite of tipping points you'd be triggering and huge large-scale migration of people, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think we'd manage that transition. I think we absolutely have to you know, do what we're all here to do, which is compel our elected leaders to go for the one and a half degrees C. OK, so I think we've grounded ourselves in reality. Let me quote you something that, or, that you were quoted as saying by the FT recently. The good news, uh, and this is our segue to uh, away from a council of despair, <laughs> is uh, these impacts, you were, it was in reference to global heating and the heating map can be greatly reduced if humanity succeeds in curbing global warming. I don't think I've ever come across a bigger if, right? Yeah. But um, we were talking just before we came out here about a whole different set of tipping points. Uh, talk us through how you think slash hope, you know, humanity, society, science can respond in a, in a mirror image way. Yeah, so my basic, the, the nutshell of my, my thinking and the message would be if we want to avoid these bad climate tipping points, we've got to find and trigger some good positive tipping points in society and our relationship with technology and with other living things. And I've really refocused my attention in the last year or two with colleagues to try to identify some of those positive tipping points that are being triggered and that could be triggered. And working with Simon Sharp, who's one of the lead negotiators in the COP26 team here, we were able to show that there's been a positive tipping point for shutting coal burning out of electricity generation here in the UK. It was 40% of power generation in 2012. It's less than 2% now. And I can talk a little bit about the, how that became irreversible. Also in Norway, the uptake of electric vehicles, that's past a tipping point where, thanks to some some, in, some enlightened policy, they're the same price to buy as a petrol or diesel car, and the p people are buying them in preference. At it's 60% market share for full battery electric vehicles. Now, the crucial point here is that there are these reinforcing feedbacks within society, within the economy, that, um, that become self-propelling, just like there are the bad self-propelling feedbacks in the climate system. What are they? Well, they're familiar things like we, we've all heard about learning by doing. The more we make something, the better we get at making it. But we've probably also all heard of economies of scale. The more we make something, the cheaper the next unit gets to make. And the economies of scale for solar photovoltaic power, for offshore wind turbines, for batteries and electric vehicles are all spectacular. And they mean that the further we push on these transitions, the faster they're going to go. And the, you'll get to a point, you can really get to a point where they become self-propelling. So as a scientist, have you, have you had to transition to being a social scientist? <laughs> well, 
for whatever reason, I've always been a polymath. I've always been w wanting to learn new things, um, passionate about learning new subjects. So hopefully you can see that the same systems thinking is infusing my work on the solutions as it does my work on the problems. But yeah, I'm, I'm, fo I'm forcing myself as ever to learn new things now on, on about technology, transitions about social dynamics, uh, th phenomena called con co social contagion, simple and complex. And I'm trying to synthesize that knowledge together now to try and write, write a kind of roadmap for how do we operationalize these positive tipping points. I won't pretend that I've, I've written a full roadmap, but working with a whole bunch of friends, um, we're, on, we're on that journey. And I think it's that prescription that many, many of us are crying out for now, right? I think I see a lot of decision makers paralyzed by complexity, when instead I would say kind of complex systems and this kind of complexity is our opportunity if we can find and trigger these positive tipping points. But we need, to, we need to work out the formula, right? We need to work out what coalitions of actors acting in what order on what things have the greatest potential to tip the change we need. Tricky. Uh, let me come back to coal. Right. I, can, mm -hmm. I can see how economies of scale make uh, uh, cuts in the price of wind and solar irreversible. But coal is obviously a huge uh, talking point at COP. Yeah. It's a huge factor in whether, we, whether the planet remains habitable. And there's the story of how the UK managed it, which I believe, well, you can talk a bit about that. Sure. But, but how can that, uh, it needs to happen in India, Indonesia, China. Uh, is there data that suggests it's part of an ir irreversible trend? Yes, I would say so. I probably should say a few words about how did the tipping point happen in the UK. And yeah. if you don't know already, it is because there was some price put on carbon purely in the power generation sector on top of the baseline EU carbon price. And that price, that additional carbon price in the UK was stepped up over time a couple of times. Uh, to a point where um, it, after you'd used up all the renewable power you had on the grid, uh, instead of going for coal as the next cheapest option, it switched the economics so that gas was the next choice. Right. Now, that, those prices of coal and gas and power generation are fluctuating all the time. You'd have thought that was a reversible transition, but basically the people who were invested in coal power realized they weren't making any money and they started to pull out. The utilities then turned around and, and got to the point where they were just literally destroying coal-fired power plants in the UK. And once you're at that point, you're in irreversible tipping point territory. Now, when you look to the global picture, the good news story is, of course, the declining price of renewable power generation and battery storage uh, in a renewable electricity future. And at the moment, if you take out the perverse subsidies that are still there on coal power um, extraction and generation, the, the new for new comparison, as it's called, is that wind and solar are the cheapest form of power generation in many countries already. There's still perverse things in the system. Certain banks that I could name if, if required are still making it much easier to raise capital for a given amount of new power generation from some whacking great new coal plant in, say, sub-Saharan Africa than it is to raise the finance to actually generate the same amount of power cheaper by a much more dispersed and diffuse bunch of renewables. That has to change, and that is in the hands and the power of some people to change. Okay. We're very nearly at the point where we'll uh, start taking start with a question from, from the internet. But without going down a whole uh, economics tributary, can mm -hmm. I just ask, uh, and I'm out of my depth already here, but one would assume that uh, the very low marginal cost of extra power once you've installed your re renewables makes it extremely attractive. But I was hearing the other day that from an investor's point of view, it might be the reverse, <laughs> uh, and that that is going to lead to a plateauing of uh, installation of wind and solar. Is that a concern? Um, possibly, but it's, isn't it so easy? You know, you hear this all the time from the financial sector, not wanting to be rude or anything, but, no, you know, ahead, we, suddenly, we suddenly transition risk is, is being bandied around as such a profound problem that, well, we can't transition too quickly because of the transition risk. This is an existential threat we're talking about. Mm. 
Um, we've got to do some sane risk weighing up here. We have to commit to the transformation. And once we commit, there are jobs and there's a, and economic growth galore in, in this transformation. So, yeah, there'll always be queries, doubts, and things in the mix that aren't going to go right. If, to be blunt, um, we don't need to worry about whether really rich actors might lose a bit. We need to make sure this transformation is just. We need to make sure there's a social safety net for poor people who might suffer from the transformation. But that's politics, and smart politicians know and have shown how, how to do that. And then in the middle ground of those of us who are neither spectacularly rich or spectacularly poor, we need to form the coalitions that get behind wanting the transformation to, to kind of win the dynamics over some of the very rich vested interests that are stalling it. Okay, great, thank you very much. Now, um, I think at this point I need to ask Anya uh, to bring us a question for Tim from online. Make sure we can hear you. And then please, everybody else, if I can see you, start raising your hands. Yes, thank you. What a great um, discussion. I was wondering if there is a struggle with getting policy to listen to science, and how do you see this changing, particularly in the negotiations over the next week? Excellent question. I suppose I don't feel that as a deep, profound trouble, but that's probably because of a biased personal experience, because I've had policy come to me to, for, for, for advice and for collaboration, crucially. So I mentioned that, I mean, one of my best collaborators at the moment is Simon Sharp, who's over there in the main building, being a key part of the UK's negotiate, COP26 negotiation team. And we've worked together on this positive tipping points formula, if you like, evidence. And he's been the one who's been, you know, putting that into the minister's speeches and getting it in statements made and yesterday that you might have heard from multiple major nations to get behind this transformation. So I'm kind of guardedly optimistic when I get the pleasure and the privilege to work with someone, you know, that smart who's in there in the civil service here driving change. Obviously not all politi politicians are, are on the same page with this. But um, I feel like the world has now kind of heard the bad news message clearly enough that we're all now on the, we're all now broadly on the same hymn sheet of one, let's go try, try, try for 1.5 degrees C. The crucial politics and conversation now is really, can we have actions commensurate with the words, with the political rhetoric? That's where the gap is. It's not climate scientists who, who can help with that, but it is those who are scientifically clued up on the numbers for the transformation who can really help hold the politics to count. And that's where politics and politicians need to be called out, and that's where the dialogue needs to be really strong or stronger. Because right now, we've got you know rhetoric that simply isn't matched by action, that just doesn't add up. But it could add up, and we know what the action should look like. Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, now, I'm going to try and screen out. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, three rows back in the blue shirt. Oh, hi. I'm uh, Ingo uh, from Berlin, in class. Um, I'm wondering um, why the economic inflection point, the economic tipping point, has not been communicated to the COP. Delegations. So I've talked to 30 delegations, and you can see the Bloomberg energy data, for example, since 2017, it's cheaper to build wind and solar as compared to existing running old depreciated coal plants. That's for Germany, India, China, Absolutely. and the US everywhere. Why is that not communicated to the delegation? It's so easy to solve the climate. Wind and solar at half the price, that is so nice. I'm 100% with you, Ingo, and I, perhaps like you, am, of course, here trying to communicate that message. I can tell you that for sure, Simon Sharp, who I mentioned, and the team, the COP26 unit from the UK Cabinet Office, have been busy trying to communicate that in all their negotiations leading up to this moment and beyond it. And it, some of it has got through. I don't think it got as much coverage yesterday in the media as it should have done. But there was a statement put out by including major players, India, China, so on, that did acknowledge this knowledge and, okay, I wish they would get it quicker, but um, 
let's all keep pushing. Let's all, if you, if you get that same message, and media organizations, you know, um, let's, just, let's just get that out there in the public discourse, because as you say, um, it's, it's, it's evidence, right? It's crucial evidence. As the journalist in the room, or one of them, it's my job to ask the um, dumb questions. Summarize this economic inflection point for us, for, for people like me who are not quite sure which bit of the <laughs> argument we're talking about. Well, I think the one that Ingo was just pointing at is that um, if, we just, so if we take away the biasing due to subsidies and other taxes and other sort of things, and we just look at, say, what's called a new-for-new new generation cost comparison of, say, wind and, or solar versus coal, wind, especially offshore wind yeah. or solar, are the cheapest in pretty much every country now. Now, you have to be honest and fair here and say, well, with renewables, you've always got matching supply and demand. When I, wanna, when I put the kettle on, it's not necessarily when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. Hence, I need some storage as well. So you might want to do a comparison which is not just new for new, but it's new plus storage for your renewables compared to new coal or gas. Yeah. Even that comparison is looking good for renewables and battery storage because the batteries are getting spectacularly cheaper now. Then you might say that's one tipping point. The next one is when, when does it work as a new for old comparison? That means when does it make economic sense to decommission a coal-fired power plant that's got useful life left in it or a gas-fired one and replace it with new renewables? Well, we're already at that point for gas in China, for example, and we were less than 10 years from that point in China for coal. So it's kind of perverse that they do still build some new coal power stations in China, because this is widely known data. Um, but I hope that gives you a flavor uh, in this particular sort of microcosm of power, which, of course, power generation is instrumental here, but we also should still be talking about electrified transport, transform form and food and land systems, and so on. We are short of time. Um, anybody else has some questions for Tim? Yes. Let me take a couple, maybe three, and we'll, we'll store them up, and then um, we'll see if Tim can answer them all. Yes. At the, towards the back there, and was there another one on the right-hand side? We'll come to it if there is. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Emma Crowley, I'm from Engineers Without Borders UK, um, and an engineer by training. Um, it's our belief that there's a tipping point needed within the engineering community mm -hmm. um, to really wake up to the fact and the risks of the technology revolution as well, to produce outcomes that are safe and just. Um, what do you think is required to create such a tipping point within, a, within the engineering community more specifically? Re really good question. Just the quick answer probably is something about well, I know the Royal Academy of Engineering here in the UK is kind of getting behind this, but you kind of need, obviously you want to make sure that, this, that's, that standards are changing within the application of engineering, like in buildings and so on. But I think in, in, the, in, the, in the discipline of engineering, I suppose it needs to come at the top level that, there's, that something like the leading academies are really accrediting for this or demanding accreditation for this or demanding that to be a top engineer, you meet a certain standard of awareness and innovation on tackling the climate problem. That would make a big difference. You, so it's really about all of those very human incentives, I think. Shifting the incentive structure so that uh, a discipline that's profoundly important here really focuses its attention on, on innovation. Because um, the backstory here is, why have we let ourselves get into a ridiculous doldrum where we just haven't been innovating as societies for decades, and um, it, we desperately need to turn that round. We need a, a sort of new flowering of, of innovation to, to do this great transformation in the next generation. And we definitely need engineers in that. We might have time for one more quick question from the floor. If not, um, uh, I'm going to uh, take advantage of my position here to ask one. Very quickly. You were inspired by James Lovelock and Gaia. Mm -hmm. It's still the same planet mm -hmm. under much greater stresses. Um, how resilient is it? Or is there any way back sort of by the, 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 the natural uh, systems of the planet by themselves? Or have the tipping points that we've discussed today already pushed us beyond that point? Well. Uh 
a large chunk of the back biosphere made up of microbes is incredibly resilient, but it's the, it's the complex creatures like you and I and the other complex creatures like the beautiful trees in the room or, or the other animals that are, can be the more fragile. Um, so the real risk in the sixth mass extinction is, is one for stuff we relate to, big, complex, living things. Um, what can I say? We're not, I, there is great potential for the biosphere to regenerate um, and we see that in the microcosm of, of positive tipping points at, at ecological scales where, where communities have reoriented their relationship with nature, with their re ecosystems like restoring coral reefs, marine, marine protected areas, you name it. If you work with the biosphere and other species, we know that positive reinforcing feedbacks can start to work in your favor and tip you back into a regenerated, better social ecological state. So this is what I would think of as working with Gaia or towards what I call Gaia 2.0. If we can get to that place, especially in reinventing our food and land systems, then yeah, great, that's crucial to, to this great transformation. It's, so yeah, Gaia's not for, for sure got resilience, but it's really about working with her pow the powers of regeneration that are there in the biosphere and getting in feedback loops, good feedback loops with those other living things. And my word, we've got a task to do there in transforming the global food and land system, because honestly, we won't have time to talk about it now, but that's the bit that's, that's the bit that, that's the bit of getting to net zero that we don't know how to do yet. We do have one minute left. I was looking at the timer and it was, it's going in the opposite direction than I thought. So tell us a bit about the food and land uh, agriculture system. Well, I've started to work on this with the Food and Land Use Coalition, but we have a sort of hegemonic um, global food system that's become, in network terms, pretty fragile, I think, because it looks a whole lot like the banking sector did before the 2008-9 crash, with a few really large players um, and very kind of homogeneous ways of doing things. We need to imagine, first we need to imagine a completely different regenerative agricultural system with many diverse ways of doing things in different places. And then crucially, we've got to answer the question of how can these diverse islands of innovation make headway against this sort of incumbent monolith of a system and scale up. That's the big crux problem there. And that's why I don't pretend I've got all the answers, but that's why I'm working so hard now on trying to identify the reinforcing feedbacks and the positive tipping points that can help lots of great innovations in that sector get to scale and yeah, create this alternative and much more resilient um, food, food system that we'll need. Professor Tim Lenton, we're out of time, but thank you so much. Thanks, Charles. Coal, EVs, food and agriculture, positive feedbacks, we hope.